right thank you alex alexis uh, for that uh, generous introduction um and also thanks uh, the organizers for for inviting me uh it's a great privilege uh to be here um i'm going to talk about computational photography and you know maybe it's faster maybe it's cheaper but arguably we can say that uh this transition from film to digital hasn't changed photography photography fundamentally um <clears throat> see. if we look at this really commendable effort of uh, a kodak you know dcs series uh, early in the 90s um uh married with a nikon f3 uh and if you just look inside that you realize the film cartridge is still there it's film to digital but the cartridge is still there uh and as my colleague jack tumblin likes to say digital photography uh it's like a caged lion that after years you uncage in a jungle uh and stays in one place rather than running off and exploring uh, the space around him so we have a message here we have uh, what billion people with tools of uh, visual communication but we are still following the principle of a human eye um if you just look at the space of successful biological vision it's it's very diverse you have based on shadows based on refraction based on reflection scallops don't have lenses light comes in and gets reflected off of this concave mirror and uh, onto the sensor or lobsters have this vertical parallel mirrors that focus light on this curved sensor and these are these are biological creatures that are not even doing sophisticated computation afterwards so we really have an opportunity to explore the space of imaging the whole pipeline from capture to to display the way we have solved so far uh the problem of photography and the problem of capturing and sharing visual information is we said let's make the photograph compatible what, what with what the human eye sees so we try to mimic a lens that behaves like uh the the uh the cornea and then we have a detector that mimics uh the retina and that's kind of the end of end of the story that's your image um and we have basically solved this problem of kind of matching my experience by reproducing what my eye will see this is great for 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 direct view uh but if you want to manipulate that and if you want to understand the world and do something additional with the photos this model simply doesn't work we need to go beyond just mimicking what a human eye can see so if you think about in the wish list of of uh, photography uh these are the kind of answers we get you know if you ask the consumers uh they want amazing resolution some kind of a you know superhuman vision of course high speed they might be they might want to see inside their bodies maybe it's a medical device uh that becomes a camera uh cameras that automatically trigger maybe based on a smile or some external event um and to deal with you know the millions of photos you take you want to keep only the good pictures and find the most relevant ones uh but i guess you know the most common uh request we get uh, i'm sure uh, you hear about all the time is put the photographer somehow back into the picture <laughs> so when i go on a trip you know i'm i'm still in my own pictures uh and of course uh many of you here deal with you know these other wish lists um cost of course uh, resolution low light sensitivity very challenging problems right uh, stereo and 3d we're going to hear uh, a lot about that um and mechanical free motion uh, of uh, of for zoom and for focus um for improving sharing auto tagging recognition uh, and all these problems and these are very critical problems uh, and these are i would say are at the at the top of uh, everybody's wish list i'm going to go a little bit beyond that and see if i can kind of push the envelope of of what we can dream 
no, can we create cameras and, and mechanism so that I can take a photo of what's around the corner beyond what's the line of sight? Or can I create cameras and, and, and software so that instead of a photo, what I get out is an emotive, artistic rendering? So, so this talk really should be about, you know, kind of the wish list of, of uh, what computational photography can deliver beyond today's uh, digital photography. Uh, and by definition, um, as a wish list, not all these problems can be solved today. Um, but what I will try to do is uh, kind of give you my own, share my own bias of, uh, of what kind of things uh, I wish for. Uh, and also tell you the kind of things I'm doing, my group is doing, and, and other people are attempting as well. And you're welcome to join and, and share your own thoughts uh, as well. Um, let's see. I think it's getting cut off. All right, we'll go with it. Uh, and the field of computational photography, we had a session here a couple of years ago, um, is, is looking at this problem in very interesting ways. Uh, on the on the y-axis, we have kind of the complexity of capturing. Uh, down here, we have the the goals of synthesis. Um, if you think about the digital photography, you capture the raw information, just you know photons to electrons at a good signal to noise ratio. And the synthesis is very low level. I just give you the pixels. That's it. Uh, you can go a little bit beyond that and start capturing high dynamic range wider field of view, improve the resolution, maybe create a focal stack, uh, and so on. And then, uh, you know, m more spectrum, uh, capturing some non-visual data, such as GPS and uh, communication with other devices, metadata, image priors, and so on. And a lot of the work is focused on kind of this, this axis here. But the way computational photography wants to, wants to think about this problem is not just the low-level experience of photography, which is, as I said, kind of a direct impedance matching with your eye, but be able to manipulate and have a meaningful extraction of the semantics of those photos, of those photons. So you want to have some mid-level cues because, you know, even human vision we don't really care about absolute intensity. We care about regions and boundaries and segmentation and motion and what's foreground, what's background, what's lit directly by light, what is being, what's lit by uh, scattering of light, uh, and so on. And so we want to create mechanisms such as camera arrays and light fields and so on so that we can relight the scene or we can insert a visual object and so on. And as Alexis said, the human stereo vision is giving you this mid-level cues, but we don't have to stop at what the biology can do for us. We really want to create an augmented uh, human experience and create hyper-realistic synthesis uh, of our photos. And what I mean by that, let, let, let's go through that uh, one at a time. So my wish number one, uh, the ultimate post-capture control where very few decisions are taken at the time of capture. I should be able to just take out a camera, wave it, not worry about low light or motion blur or focus or the viewpoint and snap away and give me amazing control uh, in post. And uh, the, the special effect industry tries to do that, but how can we bring that to, uh, to the consumers? And one good example, I'm sure many of you are familiar, is this concept of a planoptic camera, which was invented actually 100 years ago in, in uh, 1908 by Lippmann um, and has, been, has progressed significantly um, uh, over, the, of course, the last 100 years. Uh, Ted Adelson and others at uh, MIT in 92 uh, and then the very famous uh, camera from Stanford uh, and, and refocus imaging where you can convert a 16 megapixel sensor into a 300 by 300 pixel image but then you can change the focus after the photo is taken. Right? Very impressive. Um, amazing post-capture control. Um, and if you zoom in on that, you'll realize that the photo is actually encoded. It's not just raw pixels. 
uh, that, that you are capturing. It's actually encoding the angular variation that's coming through the lens. Well, the, as you can see, the problem is you go from a 16 megapixel sensor to an image that's only 300 by 300 pixel, you give up a lot of resolution, and in addition to that, you introduce new optics, which means you have all the usual issues of chromatic aberration, geometric aberrations, uh, alignment, and so on. So it turns out, uh, after a few years of thinking about it, we realize you can convert any camera into this light field or a panoptic camera uh, for about a couple of dollars uh, in 35 seconds. All you do is, in this case, it's a Mamiya a digital bag, and you drop a film, which has a special pattern that's printed on that. Uh, it's resting just barely on the sensor. It's not directly on the sensor. It's just about a millimeter on top of the sensor. Uh, and you can think of this almost like a parallax barrier for, for 3D displays, but it's not because it's, most of the light is actually passing through. Uh, it's doing encoding of the incoming direction of light. In parallax barrier, it becomes angle-dependent as well. Here we're capturing information uh, that's angle-dependent. And once you do that, you can capture a 2D photo um, and convert that into not a serial pair, but an array of 121 virtual views. And each of these views is as if you have moved your viewpoint through the aperture. So the wider your aperture, the more parallax or more disparity you will get between those views. And as you can imagine, from this, uh, from any pair of this, you can, of course, create uh, 3D imagery, stereo views. You can extract 3D depth information, and you can also do digital refocusing. So again, instead of using macro lens array by adding more optics, uh, and there are also other efforts, uh, for example, from Adobe of putting lenses in front, uh, optics will always add issues for, for different colors and spectrum, but by using the so-called heterodyne camera, uh, there are no additional geometric or chromatic aberrations. Extremely low cost. Uh, you don't have to worry about the zoom of F or F number being compatible uh, with this because there's no additional optics. And the, the most important part is that you can still recover a full resolution of your image. Right? You lose some light. In, in, in our current prototype, it's 50%. We're trying to improve that. And this is a, a way to inf include more 3D, or in this case, 4D information about the world. That was for post-capture control of focus. What about motion? A common problem uh, for, for low-light condition. And here's, here's a solution uh, that, that seems to work. Instead of keeping the shutter open, for the entire duration of your exposure, if you flutter it open and closed in a carefully chosen binary sequence, it turns out you can uh, record sufficient information about the scene. So here's the same photo again. If you zoom in, uh, this is on a street, uh, Broadway, right in front of our office in Cambridge. Uh, if you zoom in, uh, you can barely make out the car and the license plate. Which car make is this? If you de-blur, you get Volkswagen. I guess Audi is Volkswagen moving really fast. <laughs> so by, by fluttering the shutter, uh, what we are doing in the, in the kind of thinking about in the, in the signal processing domain is we are preserving all the high special frequencies because we are applying a convolution that's frequency preserving or is broadband. And so using this mechanism, you can support uh, post-capture deblurring, much like post-capture refocusing uh, here. Okay, that was about focus and motion. What about lighting? You know, we have gone from this really monstrous cameras to something that we can carry in our pocket. But what's happening to light? The difference between a professional and a consumer is still the lighting. We still have to carry around you know, the spotlights and umbrellas and so on. Uh, so here's a wish list. How can I use my camera and a compact flash on it and in post-capture create any lighting for the right mood? Okay. It's challenging. Uh, there are a lot of efforts going on uh, in this direction. My group, uh, uh, Paul Debevec at USC, has built a dome 
uh, which allows you to do relighting for, for actors, uh, for special effects. That's used in uh, Batman and, and, and many other movies. Uh, but I want to allow that ability right on my camera. Right? So to make it more precise, we want to emulate studio lights from Compact Flash. Okay? Wish number two. Freedom from form. When it comes to uh, zoom or when it comes to the quality of image, um, it seems like if, if you carry, if, if you want a, a 50 millimeter lens versus a 200 millimeter lens, you must get a lens that's four times as long. Um, and, and this is just very, very painful. I want some freedom from that. Uh, will I be able to carry a camera tomorrow that's like my business card, as flat as that, um, and I can just wave it around and, and capture a, a, a nice photo? And the way we have been solving this problem, especially for mobile phone cameras, is to make the cameras really thin. We are shrinking them in all dimensions, not just in Z, but also in X and Y. And the reason for that is we are again trying to mimic the human eye. We think by, by reducing the depth of the camera to down to 5 millimeters and 3 millimeters, we are creating a thin camera, but we are capturing less and less light. And we need to go away from that. Remember the scallop, remember the lobster, they're not trying to mimic a traditional lens. They're exploiting very clever mechanism to capture a lot of light using multiple lenses, using different kind of sensors, and so on. Uh, you may be familiar with the origami lens that was part of the montage program by Joe Ford at uh, UCSD and, and the Tombow, uh, which is in Japan, and also uh, in, in, at Duke University by, by David Brady and others. Beautiful efforts. Um, and we really want to get around that and, and, and create flat cameras. So here is, here is a wish list. How can we convert your LCD on your mobile device into a camera? Now, Sharp has started creating LCDs where every emitting pixel of your LCD is also light sensing. Uh, and they're, they're, the main application for that is for sensing touch. So you, if you put a finger right on this LCD, you can actually recover your fingerprint. It's extremely high resolution. Now, what I would like to do is convert that LCD, which is already sensing light, into a full-fledged camera. Right? And it's going to cover a lot of light. It's four inches by five inches. It's, it's going to collect more light than the most fancy SLR you may have. So how do you do that? The problem is, the moment I take my finger off this LCD, everything's going to be completely blurred because this, this light-sensing LCDs are not designed to do that. So we set about thinking about how we can convert these light-sensing LCDs into cameras and initially support 3D gestures, but also support video conferencing. Uh, and the idea is, again, very similar to parallax barriers, where the LCD can do double duty. In, in even frames, it can show you the image, but in the odd frames, it can act as a parallax barrier. Uh, and by doing that, uh, we can support this uh, type of uh, touch and hover gestures. So this is the prototype uh, that we built. Uh, as you can see, you can, uh, this bar here shows the depth of the hand, roughly. Uh, you can scale and, uh, and, and manipulate. Uh, and of course, you, you can do this seamless transition between touch and hover, all from this very thin LCD form factor. Uh, and that's how it works. You create these hundreds of virtual views. From that, you can do digital refocusing and potentially create video conferencing, where if I sit in front of my LCD, only within a meter, the images will be seen, but anything uh, more than a meter away will be completely blacked out. Right? So it can also be privacy preserving and, and create the right effects. And because it's collecting light over such a large area, low light is not a problem. What about depth of field? You know, there are, there, are, uh, there are folks here who are working on how to extend the depth of field. But if you think about photography, we pay a lot of money to actually make the depth of field shallower. Right? So, yes, in some applications I would like extended depth of field, but I would also like to take compact cameras 
And by the way, this is not a comparison between Samsung and Canon by, by, by any means. It's just those were the images conveniently available. But with a compact camera, I don't get a shallow depth of field. Um, and if I pay a lot of money for the glass, I can. Right? So how can I create tiny cameras that can actually create shallow depth of field? It turns out your image stabilization mechanism, where you have a relative motion between your lenses and sensors, actually does it for you. Typically, the way stabilization works is it's trying to compensate for the, uh, the, the jitter or shake uh, when you're holding the camera. It's trying to compensate. But imagine even if you're holding the camera steady, if you intentionally shake the camera, lens, and the sensor, you end up getting shallow depth of field. All you have to do is have a very precise relative motion between the lens and the sensor. And if you move them with just the right relative speeds, it turns out you can focus on any particular plane and you can essentially create a lens in time as opposed to in space. So here is a, a small aperture photo. And by creating this relative motion, you can focus in the front, focus in the back, or focus in the back, all the way in the back. Right? So freedom from form. Maybe it's possible. Uh, wish number three. I would like to create, I would like to have cameras and software and, and, and photo frames that understand my world. Right? This is like solving the AI problem or the computer vision problems. But a lot of those problems, you know, uh, academicians and researchers have been working on them for a long time, um, and they're still challenging. But beyond the camera, there is something else. Now we have the network. Uh, we ha I guess we have a session on, on mobile 2.0, and we really want to exploit the network of cameras, the network of photos. So here is a dream. Can I take a photo at the Trevi Fountain or the Old Town in, in Prague, a simple 2D photo, and automatically convert that into a 3D photo? Now, it's very challenging to do that if you solve it as an artificial intelligence problem, but if you exploit the concept of photo tourism, which was developed by University of Washington and, and Microsoft, and later on became Photosynth, you can actually try to place your photo into the 3D space of all the photos other folks have taken. And by doing that, you can figure out, first of all, the exact location and the viewpoint of your camera. And for every pixel in your photo, you can also figure out how far that point is from where you took the photo. Um, and we really want to see how we can use the internet as kind of the fifth element of a camera. The first four elements are the, the optics, the sensor, the illumination, and on onboard processing. And the fifth element is really the online collection and, and the access to that. So coming back to this dream of being able to see around a corner, you know, how can we help the bunny uh, avoid Elmer so you can, you can still, still get the carrots here? Um, it seems like, uh, you know, we have been taught that when we take a photo, what you capture is within the line of sight. Um, and uh, it seems like we're able to see beyond line of sight here. Uh, and that's the way it works is, is based on echo. Uh, if you close the doors, the way my, my voice echoes in this room is different than when the door is open. And by doing an analysis of that echo, actually it turns out I can tell you what's just around this door. Uh, or I can tell you, you know, what's written behind your shirt or behind your chair uh, in this particular case. But for that, we have to understand the world at a much higher dimensions. And so for that, we have developed so-called femtophotography, where we are using lasers that have a duration of a few femtoseconds. So that's 10 to the minus 15 seconds. Nano, pico, femto. And if we have some serious synchronization between the flash and a very fast sensor, which is also working in a picosecond range, it turns out you can analyze and compute what's around the corner. So we have some initial experiments, um, and, and, and it's very promising. Um, 
And when we see, we, when we can see beyond the line of sight, um, so far we are not breaking any laws of physics. <laughs> uh, and, and if we are breaking the laws, uh, please give us a buy on this one because we will show you something interesting. All right. While we are trying to help uh, uh, the, the bunny here, the barcodes are taking over the world. They are everywhere, and they're getting larger and larger. Um, and the barcodes are for machines, not for humans. So why are they cluttering our world? Uh, so how can we create, again, imaging pipelines so that the encoded information that's for machine-to-machine -machine interaction, your camera to your barcode, is aesthetic and pleasing. So these are various forms of barcodes you may have seen, QR code, the Microsoft code, and, and, and the data matrix, and so on. And this is a new code called Bo code that uh, we have developed. Uh, and the way it works is it's only three millimeters by three millimeters. And if you just throw the camera out of focus, the out of focus blur reveals the pattern that we have encoded in this three millimeter by three millimeter barcode, even from several meters away. Okay? So we are able to create a basically a barcode that you can photograph from several meters away, and it takes up only three millimeters by three millimeters. And we're exploiting the concept of coding in angle. So again, to the naked eye, or, or, of, or a camera that's taking uh, photo in sharp focus, it looks like a tiny dot. Um, typically, you encode information in t space, like a traditional 2D barcode, or time by blinking, or by wavelength uh, in fiber optics communication. But here, we're encoding an angle. So this Bo code, which is Bokeh-based code, um, exploits the circle of confusion. And a traditional circle of confusion, I'm sure you're familiar as photographers, looks like a disk. But here we're converting the circle of confusion into circle of information. And with that, you can, of course, apply them to uh, uh, product tags and support augmented reality applications because they're very aesthetic. They don't clutter up your space, put them on greeting cards or, or PlayStation games. Um, um, or even start putting them on, on in the real world so that cameras that may be scanning the city uh, can communicate with them and you can basically opt in or opt out or provide more information to these cameras that are scanning your world. So we really want these cameras that understand our world and communicate with information that's around us without actually cluttering it up. And the best part of Bo codes is that if I use a cell phone camera and I hold it right next to me, I have one over here with me, you can capture 100,000 bits of information, about 10,000 bytes of information locally, as opposed to a traditional barcode that gives you only about 100 bits of information. So you can, you know, you can put a whole ringtone or a song or a picture in, in 10,000 bytes of, uh, of information. All right, uh, wish number three. I don't have time here. All right, wish number three was about understanding the world. And, you know, I really want to have a camera where I can take a picture and it will recognize not just people and, and, and things like that, but it will give me an index of each material. If I take a picture, it will tell me what's fabric, what's wood, what's skin, what's, what's glass, what's metal, and all that. Uh, because if, if, if my camera can do that, and uh, those of you familiar with astronomy, we can look at materials that are you know, light years away by doing spectral analysis uh, of, those, of those materials or, or in, in, in medical imaging and in forensics. But if you use the right type of lights and right type of sensors, uh, and, and sophisticated algorithms, I'll be able to index all these things. And then if you open up your, your favorite photo editor, you can just click and replace and edit anything you want. And again, we'll get closer to the dream of being able to relight and, and create new moves uh, in a scene. And creating this 3D awareness, uh, I'm, I guess it's going to be a, a big theme of the discussion this afternoon. 
we again want to think about the whole pipeline. Uh, stereo is, is a great start, but of course we want to have a complete 3D awareness, not just what's in the line of sight, but maybe possibly beyond uh, the line of sight. All right, so the last one, how to share our visual experience. You know, that's what photography is all about, capturing and sharing uh, our visual experience. So there are a lot of efforts. LifeLog uh, is coming. We have been hearing about it uh, for quite some time. But now the processing power and storage and communication um, uh, are at a stage where 24-7 uh, uh, life logs are interesting. But who wants to look at them? They're extremely boring, uh, uh, very repetitive. Uh, so we want new techniques that create automated summary of not just what was captured from my own camera that was on 24-7, but from cameras that were around me. If I create the right mechanism between uh, the cameras of strangers and my camera, I will actually get a story, a summary, a meaningful abstract of the activities. So being able to change the viewpoint, change the lighting, change the mood, um, and of course be able to tell a story from multiple perspectives. Um, and that may be helpful not just kind of in a narcissistic way, uh, but for, for, for health, for education, uh, for, of course, entertainment, uh, and even governance. You know, there are a lot of issues that deal with uh, transparency and access to information, uh, but if you start uh, logging a lot of data and start sharing it in the same way we share our financial data, um, maybe not, and our, our health data, um, if you can start sharing our visual data, and create the same levels of mechanism. And the problem that comes up right away is privacy. Uh, over dinner with, with uh, uh, Alexis and, and Lenny yesterday, we, we heard about the bling ring <laughs> uh, in LA. Fascinating story of, of, of teenagers uh, breaking into uh, celebrities' houses by using information that's publicly available, nothing illegal uh, in terms of, of capturing the visual information. So a dream would be the same as your, your financial or health, health data. I should have complete access to who is looking at me. Right? And this seems kind of odd because why would I have control over a picture that you have taken of me in a public space? Uh, but it's much like the robots.txt that you put on the web server. And when a search engine like Google or Yahoo is trawling through your website, the respect the robots.txt, and they will not trawl uh, further, uh, deeper uh, into your website. And what I would like to have is a robot.txt on me in the real world so that if there are cameras that are taking my picture and there are cameras that... ...some control over those pictures. Um, of course, a dream would be I can just fire a command, maybe pay $100 to some new service, in the, in the web 2.0, and just goes and deletes all those pictures. Maybe not deletes all the pictures, but blurs out all my pictures. Right? And I want to have that mechanism. And it seems, kind, it seems like we are constraining or, or, or throttling the, the, the process of exchanging visual information. But think about that. If we create that mechanism, and if we, if we give individuals that sense of control, people will be more happy to go out there and be, be photographed because they know they have a control uh, after it's taken. And the flip side of that is authentication. Uh, we have seen this you know, in, in newspaper stories where photos are manipulated or, or, or in, 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 in situations of social instability where rumors are spread uh, and so on. And we want a very good way of authenticating images. Right now, uh, I was talking to folks from ImageSpan. Uh, uh, they, were, they were explaining to me some of, some of their techniques. We want techniques not just in software, but in the whole pipeline. It's like firing a bullet from a gun. I know from which gun it came out from. I want the same mechanism for photo. I want to know from which camera it came from, and I should be able to track that throughout the life of that photo. What about photo frames? Uh, I thought they would catch on over time, but we are not there yet. Um, we really want great photo frames for sharing our visual experience. Uh, and uh, I, I, was, I was looking at uh, Bonnie's uh, uh, 3D lenticular screens, beautiful out there uh, in the lobby. 
those create this beautiful, you know, view dependent images. And uh, again, if you have cameras that can capture that, uh, it creates uh, a, a very nice experience. What about going to 6D? Uh, it turns out our world is, the appearance of our world is not 3D, but actually 4D, because we have horizontal parallax and vertical parallax. Um, uh, you know, if you have a diamond, for example, I cannot just take a photo of the diamond and slap it onto a cardboard shape of the diamond, right? That's why a diamond is not 3D. The diamond is 4D. Um, where does the additional two dimension come from? You know, 60, that sounds like a, like a marketing gimmick. Uh, but th there is more. Because the additional degrees of freedom come from lighting. Even if I have a hologram of, say, a, a flower that I captured uh, at, uh, you know, my, uh, on my latest trip, and if I, if, I, if I bring that flower home and put it in a photo frame, it simply doesn't respond to the viewpoint or, or the lighting. Maybe I can capture a hologram, or a, uh, using a camera array, I can capture the lenticular. And now it responds to the viewpoint, but does not respond to light, in my ambient light. So to create hyper-realistic photo frames, what you want is frames that respond to viewpoint as well as ambient light. So this is how we created it. Uh, as you can see, this, uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, liquor uh, bottle all the caustics and shadows and, and reflections are all captured and they're revealed one at a time depending on how the lighting changes. And if you, if you put two lights at the same time, uh, then you will see caustics and shadows from both of them simultaneously because light is linear. Um, those of you familiar with lenticulars know that by adding one lenticular layer, you can create a view-dependent effect. It turns out if you want to support view-dependent and lighting aware effect, you have to have four layers of lenticulars. That was our first design. And this is one single pixel of a 60 display. Uh, and just because of the cost of this lenticulars, it costs us right now $30 to create one pixel. So if you want to create a megapixel display, I think we need to close a lot of rounds. Um, so this hyperreal photo frames is, is, is one, one wish list. Uh, and what about printing? I should be able to print any material. Uh, in computer graphics, there's a concept called BRDF, bidirectional reflection distribution function, which basically means that uh, any given material changes with viewpoint, but also with lighting. And that's, again, a four-dimensional function. So I should be able to print not just things that look 2D, but have the right microstructure so that they respond to viewpoint uh, and lighting. And I have talked to folks in HP that are working on lots of great problems. Uh, my colleague, uh, uh, Wojciech Matusik, who was at Adobe, also was working on a, on a BRDF printer. And, and this is, again, a great dream. I should be able to go on a trip, take a picture of a fabric or, or beautiful material, and I should be able to just print it. Uh, you know, we have printers that can... Uh, 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 print on, on birthday cakes and, and on, on coffee mochas and so on. But let's, 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 let's see that in, in all possible forms uh, and shapes. And then capturing essence. That's what we care about. Uh, this picture here is not about mimicking the human eye. It's going beyond the physical quantities. It's not about geometry. It's not about uh, radiometry. It's not about photometry. Um, and then Jingyi Yu and Macmillan have created this multilinear perspective cameras uh, that can create these images. And if you, if, you, if you go to, if you are a museum and you, you pick up an artifact, the, the experience of that can never be captured by shooting a photo of that. Um, so we really want to capture the essence. Or if you take a ride on a roller coaster, no video or no photograph can, can really uh, bring that back to you. Um, and this is really an opportunity with computational photography going beyond digital photography to enable new forms of visual arts. That, that bridge between purely synthetic to something that's live and real. So here's something uh, we tried. Uh, if you, want to, if you want to share with your friend what's inside your car, 
uh, just take a photo. But if car makers want to tell you what's inside the car, they hire artists in the car instruction manuals. Why do they do that? Seems strange to create sketches or something that can be photographed. The answer is, is straightforward. Real world is not, you know, it's not the best way to convey information and, and aesthetics. Shadows, clutters, sometimes too many colors. Um, and artists are really great at, at highlighting what's most important and sometimes using intentionally very simple colors. So how about this challenge? Why not create a camera, and again the whole pipeline, that gives me this photo as opposed to this photo? Again, a camera can never do as good a job as an artist, but the artist can at least start with something that's closer to this than this. Here's a trick that, that we, we used and to get kind of closer to this goal. And the idea is to use actually a multi-flash camera. When you release the shutter, instead of taking one photo, it takes four photos by flashing one flash, uh, one light at a time. And you know that when you take a picture uh, with a flash that's offset from the lens, you get this annoying sliver of shadow at each uh, discontinuity. If you stand against a wall, you see this sliver of shadow. You can actually exploit that. If you intentionally place the flash on the right, all the shadows now will appear on the left. If you place the flash at the top, the shadows are at the bottom, and now the shadows are at the top. And actually by analyzing the shadows, you can figure out where all the shape contours are or the depth discontinuities are. That's exactly what is important perceptually, and that's what artists will, will, will draw uh, as you know, kind of the first order effect to convey the shape and, and, and uh, the, the relationship, geometric relationship. So you know, here, is a, here is a bone. If you, do, if you apply uh, just intensity edges in your favorite editor, uh, you'll mostly get garbage. Uh, but with our technique, you can analyze all the shadows and you can superimpose and already start getting kind of cartoons that you can, you can use as input to the next stage uh, of your pipeline. Uh, and then you can take something that looks really complex. You know, you may not even have a camera that has, has good color rendition and so on, but by exploiting very cheap flashes, uh, you can create, start creating uh, emo emotive uh, line drawings. Again, we are not going to replace artists by creating smarter cameras, but we want to get all the rotoscoping and all the cumbersome tasks out of the way and really let them focus on the creative aspect of creating uh, beautiful renditions. And, uh, you know, Alexis has have been threatening us with this, this uh, advanced camera, so advanced that we don't even need it, right? And here's another one. This is, this, is, this is a real competition for us. Maybe all that a consumer wants is a big black box with a big button, which has no lenses, no sensors, no flash. Right? And if you are in Times Square or if you are in Eiffel Tower, you know, it's really debatable whether you should take that picture because millions of people before you have taken that picture. So all you want is when you release the shutter, you go online and you troll Flickr and you try to retrieve an image that's taken at about the right time, in the right direction, at about the right time of day and season, and brings it back. And, and I can guarantee you that's going to be much better than, than any image you can take with, you know, with, with, with a few minutes of, of our preparation. So this is, this, is like, this is like, you know, the internet search. Back in the 90s, all of us used to have this beautiful... Uh, home pages with our own favorite links. So when Alta Vista had to create, figure out which is the most important website, they just go to all our home pages and see who has CNN listed most often. So CNN must be a very important uh, website. But the success of search engines has eliminated the need for creating our own home pages with our favorite links. So Google and others had to figure out what's the most important page, right? And the success of photography is, is the same as success of search engines. There's so many good pictures out there of so many great places that a person that's coming in now really has to take that decision whether it's worth taking that, whether it's worth investing money and time and, and, uh, and you know, all those resources to take that photo because it's never going to look like 
that photo on Flickr anyway. So we might be approaching a time when we have completely saturated the space of all the photos you can take, right? And the only delta you need is the people you care about or how you, know, how you look that day and so on. So if I'm standing in front of Eiffel Tower and I take a picture, I don't really care about how the Eiffel Tower looks, right? It, I, I don't need a camera that captures the tower really well. All, really, all I really care about is if my kid or my wife looks right in that picture. So I want this delta. It ignores most of the pixels, but only focuses on pixels that I care. And even then, I probably have a much better picture of my daughter and my wife uh, you know, somewhere in, in my photo collection. So I don't even have, they don't even have to dress the best and, you know, and, and be in the best mood, and my daughter doesn't have to smile at the right moment because all that information is already available. So our own success is creating a challenge for us. So the last one, I just want to leave it open. And I know there are a lot of, lot of fascinating people here and, and over lunch and uh, over beers and cocktails. Uh, I really want to hear from you. So with, uh, with uh, due credit to, to Doc Edgerton uh, and this beautiful imagery people are capturing with uh, rolling shutter, we don't know how many of these wish, wishes will come true. A lot of smart people around the world are thinking about it. Uh, many of them are, are uh, will see them in the next five to ten years. Some of them we won't. Uh, but we can be sure that computational photography will be there. Uh, and the photo of tomorrow will not be just recorded, but it will be computed. Thank you. Well, <clears throat> Ramesh, thank you for what I can only qualify as a roller coaster ride. <laughs> that was really astonishing. We have a few minutes. We have about five or ten Question, I'll repeat it because the, we didn't have the microphone to Lenny in time. Lenny asked whether Ramesh thinks there's going to, way, to be a way to search photos such that you can specify that you want to find a specific person like his son Noah and that that will, that will work. Yeah. So, as I said, I mean, artificial intelligence, um, you know, a lot of work has gone into it, but those kind of problems remain difficult to solve. But think about how we have solved the problems uh, in the grocery shop. Uh, you know, we, we are not trying to build smart AI systems to recognize, you know, which brand of Coke this is and which brand of bananas this is. We just put barcodes, and we get around that. So would you be willing to put a barcode on your child? <laughs> right? So I, I, I'm, I'm partly kidding there, but we're going to see mechanisms over time where we're going to create a, an ecosystem of devices, of, of optical elements, of, of sensors that communicate with each other. And as, as bizarre as that concept sounds of putting a barcode on yourself, there will be mechanisms that will allow us to securely and privately identify us uh, to, to devices. So you might carry a camera that has a communication with a beacon that's completely invisible, uh, and, and that allows you to record that. Or maybe you have such a high-resolution camera that it can directly recognize the iris. Of, of the person you're taking picture, even if the person is meters away. Right? So there'll be mechanisms that will, that will solve that problem by really using, kind of changing the rules of the game. Uh, we don't have to mimic the human vision. I mean, you probably walk around this room and you recognize half the people. Uh, but even today, uh, you know, a, a face recognition software cannot. It's, it's quite challenging in, in any arbitrary lighting conditions and, 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 uh, and changes, in, changes in viewpoint. So we have to get around that. And uh, the barcode industry didn't wait for the AI problem to solve. They said, let's just tag everything. There was a question. Two, two people to your left first, and then we'll come back to Rick. Thank what, you again. <clears throat> From an IP perspective, what does the patent picture look like on these things, both for MIT as well as also what's being granted or how narrow <laughs> these things are? I mean, how, how's this stuff going to come to market? I heard the, the word IP and Mindfield always go together. Um, and so I, I, I'm, I'm from Media Lab at MIT, where we have uh, a really interesting uh, IP model. Um, not want to pitch it here, but we have folks from DNP and Microsoft and Samsung and, and so on who are all part of Media Lab, and they actually own everything we produce. Uh, so if you're part of Media Lab, you get that. But, uh, but of course, everything else has, uh, uh, is a minefield. Uh, Rick, you're going to 
unfortunately, you're going to have to be the last question. You remember the scene in Men in Black where this little device they hold <laughs> up and it erases your memory? Yeah. Um, I was thinking, I've been listening, this is absolutely fascinating um, uh, presentation. Um, if you added something to the camera, which in addition to taking the a visual picture of a room, mm -hmm. if you held this up, it actually created a, a sound wave. Mm -hmm that bounced around and was captured at the same time as you're capturing the visual information, you'd have a, sort of have a three-dimensional model of the room for the way the sound bounces back. I just wonder if you combined the visual and then the, the sort of spatial information you would get, if it would give you a three-dimensional space you could actually move through afterwards. Yeah. Is that something you guys are looking at also in terms of using sound as well as um, light? Certainly. I, I think I hope you continue to watch movie after Men in Black because the Dark Knight came after that, and 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 you know Batman converted all the cell phones into ultrasound emitters and basically created a phototourism photosynth out of this uh, ultrasonic um, uh, 3D images. But but you're right. You're right that we should not be f even to create visual experiences. We should not rely purely on visual mechanisms. And a GPS or a compass or mobility is an example where it's not a visual sensor. But it, it plays a big role, and, and audio is the same. Uh, so a lot of these problems on looking around the corner, for example, uh, we're actually not targeting photography in the beginning. We're targeting medical imaging, uh, and, it, and we are actually using ultrasound and, and optical mechanisms simultaneously to be able to see, use endoscopes that can look in channels where you don't have a direct line of sight.